never had that experience before and you look at the look in their eyes, it's unlike anything else that can exist. It is being able to harness the soul of the universe in many ways. And so I started having the opportunity at when I was at RISD to start advocating for this. And I was lucky enough to start to actually build giant interactive musical sculptures out of trash and recycled materials called our Foundstrument Soundstrument Project. And that came from my time at RISD, where I decided, okay, what happens if we get a whole bunch of kids to just bang on a whole bunch of trash and to let out their emotions, to take the frustrations or the happiness that they feel and to put it out into the world? What happens when you create a situation like this? So I was lucky enough while I was there to do a series of very eccentric projects, let's say. And one of those was actually taking a giant sculpture I'd built called the Foundstrument Soundstrument that could attach to the back of a bicycle. And I actually bicycled it from RISD to the Providence Children's Museum. And then I got children, come and play it. The bang all over this. And then we donated it to the Rhode Island Recycling Center. And what was amazing about this experience was seeing that so much of the time kids are told to be quiet, to sit still, to be fitting these very specific parameters and structures. And if we create a safe space, that can turn into a brave space. And that by doing that, then we can bang on that and we can sing and we can dance and we can transform trash into joy. And seeing that, then how do we do that with paint? How do we do that with sculpture? How can we do that with collage or any materiality? And saying that this is actually something that has immense potential, both for people in the art world and beyond, people who may have never had experiences in the art world. And so being able to then find encouragement with especially a certain number of mentors and colleagues, that really transformed my perspective. And so I was told one of your earlier attempts of working with marginalized community was while studying at RISD. You became friends with a bunch of homeless people. And much to the dismay of your classmates and certain faculty member, you brought them on campus to visit art studios and museums. Can you tell us what were you trying to do there? What were you trying to experiment, Max? So I did a project that was called Occupy the Artolution. And it was in the early, early days of Artolution. And what we did is during the Occupy Wall Street movement, there was actually uh, across America, people made encampments in parks. And I was invited to come and do a project in the central area where it was all homeless folks. And said, can you come and make art with the community here? And I said, great, I would love to do that. Let me teach you how to dumpster dive for materials that were being thrown away by the RISD art store. So I knew that at a certain time of day, on, a, on certain days of the week, art materials that were quote unquote expired were going to be thrown away. And so I started to teach a group of homeless folks who were living in the park how to dumpster dive for free art materials. And so what we started to do is we started to actually wrap canvas that was being thrown away and especially printmaking fabric that was, that was behind paper. We started actually stretching it between trees and getting people to come paint. And these are folks who were suffering from addiction or people who had lost their homes. And they had this joy, this unbelievable joy when they were all getting to paint together. And so I said, what if I made them all alter egos? So I actually started hand sewing costumes for these folks. And actually, we agreed communally on superhero names for the people. It sounds just like a Max Frieder story. It was wild. And so we had people named like Spyro Rad and BB Bear and Samurai Mate and these names that we came up with. And we became this group of people that would go around and try to find art materials being thrown away, making art with the community on a purely grassroots level. And for me, I really felt that these folks deserved access to the world. So I brought them into my studio. We did photo shoots. I tried to bring them into the museum. With their costumes, of course. With their costumes. <laughs> and we're talking like full face paint, like capes, crazy hats that we hand sewed. Like we made this entire experience that really gave meaning to these people being here. Rather than just sitting around as a protest, we actually were, were doing these amazing actions. And they actually donated an art tent to what we call the Occupy the Art Illusion and the Ocu Crew is what we called it. And what was really interesting as a result for that is I faced a lot of people who weren't very encouraging of that, who didn't believe of bringing these worlds together, and especially to do it in such a grassroots way. And then I found other folks who were really supportive of it and said, this is exactly what we need to switch up the norm. We need to bring these worlds together to build bridges between the homeless folks that only are five minutes away or 10 minutes away who never have had access or have never been to a museum or inside of an art studio 
or been able to paint something that could then actually be valued. And what was really remarkable in the end about doing this is it really proved that this could happen. And it planted the seeds of saying, what happens if we start to try to build bridges? And of course, there will be adversarial relationships that's part of the territory, but also how do we heal those divides? And how can the arts be that catalyst? And I think that seeing that in that environment with the Occu crew, it ended up really bonding me to certain, um, certain colleagues for life who were hugely encouraging. And I had one professor who actually came down to the Occupy uh, Providence little township, if you will, and sat with all the homeless folks with us and made art together. And this professor has now, to this day, been my mentor, named Mike Fink. And it was something that made an indelible impact on his life and mine as well. And when we look at what's possible, I think this is, this is one little seedling of the types of possibilities that the arts can create. Much of your work since then is now with people at refugee camps. Do you recall your first experience at a refugee camp? Can you tell us what it was like for you? I know it was probably at an early age, right? Relatively early. It was my first um, global crisis context where um, I was working with a refugee camp. Actually, it was my first time working with what has now become my co-founder, Joel Bergner. And I was working in the Palestinian refugee camps in the West Bank in Palestine, and then working on the border of Syria in Jordan. And and a clear memory of going to both environments, which were very different from one another, as you can imagine. And I remember when I went to Za'atari refugee camp, which at the time was the largest refugee camp for the Syrian conflict, and seeing thousands of people coming in, especially children walking alone in the most desolate desert. I had one very specific memory where I remember there was a riot and we were in lockdown when we were doing this big mural painting project. And they ended up locking the space and they said, okay, you have to be evacuated in three minutes. You have to have all your stuff ready to go in three minutes. And three minutes went by and they said, there's not enough time to evacuate you. Your compound needs to be locked down and just hope that the riot doesn't spread and just stay indoors, stay inside of the tents and and just wait. So we ended up spending about three hours waiting. And I remember there was a man that I was standing with whose name was Mufle and we were painting together, right? We were just painting together. And Mufle told me, he said, and I've stayed in contact with him till this day. And he said, I fled because I didn't want to join the military. I didn't want to join the Syrian military and they were going to force me to join. And so when I was leaving, I arrived here and I actually just got a message from my brother. And I call him and he, and he actually had audio recorded the phone message and showed it to me. And this is my conversation. And they're talking back and forth. And then the brother starts to yell. And all of a sudden you hear, shoo, and then there, he's, he's continuing to yell. And then you hear, shoo, and he said, this is my last conversation. And then he was killed in Aleppo. And this was actually only two days ago, this happened. And he said, when I think about what's possible, I want to think about anything else but that. And just being able to hold a paintbrush and paint allows me to be able to escape my constant thinking about the loss of my brother. And I developed this amazing relationship with Moufle and Joel as well. We were all part of this experience. And then the riot ended up getting dispersed and the children came back to the community about two or three hours later and we were all painting. And you could tell these kids were just so thirsty to want to have joy right? They're dealing with riots. They're dealing with insecurity. They don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. They may have been separated from their families. And you could tell they were so thirsty. So I had a little harmonica that I always carry. And I started just playing the harmonica. And the minute that I started playing the harmonica, the kids start dancing, like wildly dancing, as though it was the most amazing music they'd ever heard with me with my little harmonica. So I start dancing with them. And Mufla starts dancing. And we all start dancing with the kids. And all of a sudden, this dancing bursts out of the tent into the barbed wire surrounded desert. And just with this little harmonica, just playing a couple of notes, these kids are dancing like they've never danced in their whole life. And we make a giant circle and we're dancing. And it's like this huge mosh pit of everyone laughing and, and being silly. And you could tell that that element of having joy there's nothing more sacred. There's nothing more special than that. And it gets to the core of humanity, which is that what makes us human? It is creativity. It's expression. We want to be able to tap into what makes us ourselves, which is play. And that element of play as a form of healing. To continue listening to this episode, please visit thefounderspirit.com or search for The Founder Spirit on Apple, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. 
Thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, Jennifer Wu.